Hi, I'm Yulia, and this is Burning Questions, where we discuss subjects that set the internet on fire this week. And this one particularly, we're going to be talking about what the hell is going on with the American election, and how is it going to affect Ukraine depending on who wins it in November. And we're going to be walked through it by Professor William Woolforth of Dartmouth. He teaches a subject that is poetically called the Professor of Government. Hi, William. Um, if I could ask you to introduce yourself a little bit and maybe give a little bit of a better idea to our viewers of who you are than my, you know, tiny little one sentence introduction. Yes, my name is Bill Wolforth. I've been teaching at Dartmouth College for 25 years. Before that, I taught at Georgetown and uh, Princeton. I specialize in international relations, um, U.S. foreign policy, also a long um, background studying uh, Soviet and Russian foreign policy, uh, a little bit of background in the domestic politics of U.S. foreign policy. Amazing. Thank you so much. So I guess we're going to start with the most burning question, and that is, what? how do you see the current presidential race panning out? Do you think that something had changed drastically since uh, Biden dropped out and Kamala stepped forward? And how are you seeing the dynamics change within the voting field? Based on the best expert analysis I'm uh, familiar with, uh, the race has changed from an almost certain defeat of a Biden candidacy to now more of a toss up between uh, the uh, Trump fans ticket and the Harris uh, Walls ticket. Um, he, although there's a huge uh, degree of enthusiasm, uh, a sense of momentum on the side of the Democrats, the polling suggests a very close race. So I wanted to ask you, maybe you're familiar with this. I've been doing some research and I do know, well, I mean, I, I've lived in uh, the United States for 13 years in New York myself, so I'm very familiar with American politics. But uh, one of the things that I have recently found out is that 1% of the voters in Pennsylvania are Ukrainian diaspora, and 0.5% of the voters in Michigan are also Ukrainian diaspora. And um, I wonder if that could influence the election, because the talk of the town is that Ukrainians might be able to swing the states in their favor, depending on who they're voting for, because that's quite a large percentage of voters being Ukrainian and having, you know, having their interest <laughs> in the Democrats winning. Yeah, that's a great uh, that's a great issue. I, I I have to I would need to have information on exactly how they voted last time. So the point is, those states are considered toss up states because of how close the vote count was last time. And in the last election, I'm um, I'm not sure whether the I mean, obviously, the uh, uh, Ukraine uh, war had not yet begun. Um, and, and obviously the first invasion had begun, but the full-scale invasion had not begun, and the Ukraine issue was not as salient in American politics as it's going to be in this election. And so it's possible that uh, people who identify with uh, Ukraine uh, might have an influence on the election, but still, I repeat, the polling numbers are quite close in these so-called purple or swing states, and so it's not going to be sufficient. Kamala Harris and Tim Walz have to appeal to a broad swath of voters in those states. They have to not only mobilize their base, but they're going to have to pull in some independent voters. Seeing a lot of the change in the uh, in sort of the voting field since the uh, scandalous Trump interview with the Association of Black Journalists of America, where that very much did not go according to his plan, I suppose, because of Again, like black voters are a very large population of America, and I cannot imagine that after watching this, a lot of them are going to want to give their votes away to Trump. That's right. I mean, I, 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 I agree. I have really a difficult time understanding what his strategy was or even if he had a strategy in that uh, freewheeling and controversial response to the question about uh, Kamala Harris. I think that um, if there is a theory behind it, it might be an attempt to appeal to um, black men. Uh, they had been polling uh, relatively favorably towards Trump compared to historical averages. And he may have, again, I'm totally speculating here. He may have had some idea that somehow that they would be, re they would res at least some proportion of the black male electorate could conceivably think that this was uh, 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 this criticism of Kamala Harris's identity was somehow appealing. I don't know. 
pure speculation on my part. I mean, it does seem like he likes to put tropes on people, right? As in, like, misogyny is, is quite a big thing, and that's sort of like a trope that we see as a stereotype, so maybe he was hoping that that's, that that's going to go over well, but based on the reaction of the audience that was there, male or female, that was a complete failure, which, to be fair, I, as, as a Democrat, <laughs> love to see that, and also I, as a person interested in, you know, Democrats coming to power because of Ukraine, love to see that, but at the same time, I feel like everyone is... The Democratic Party is re-energized so much based on Kamala becoming the candidate and everyone is like so sure of her victory on that side. But it's, you know, I, I'm i a little skeptical in terms of we never think Trump is going to win, right? And then he just comes out of comes out of the woodwork and does. So, you know, yeah, I think it's a big I think it's a big mistake to necessarily generalize from that elite audience in that room. So that's a highly elite audience of African-American journalists. Um, their response is probably going to mirror the response of, uh, my guess is, without any further information, my guess would be that that response would be overwhelmingly typical of the overall black electorate. However, there are there may be some subgroups uh, who, 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 for whom that uh, crazy sounding uh, uh, Trump trope uh, might, with whom they that might resonate resonate. Again, it's complete speculation on my part. Frankly, not having any inside information on Trump, uh, he looks like he was winging it. Um, and, and, and it wasn't something that was reflective of some great strategy or some great thought. Thought That winging it approach, that ad-libbing, that going with the flow has worked for Trump in many cases. It really does look like it did not work in this particular case. I mean, I think it's also the contrast, right? We're so used to seeing an 81-year-old Biden who could barely, like, tie two words together because, well, I, and, and that's not to the detriment of his uh, intellectual abilities. It's rather, it's it's obvious that, you know, he's in his 80s. It's a little more difficult to sort of do public speeches. And I think that in contrast to Biden, these things sort of worked because when you watch Biden speak and give speeches and struggle and then you watch Trump, at least he's like, you know, at least he's energized. And I think now that Kamala is in the picture winging it is not necessarily going to work, especially if he's going to be debating or speaking or talking against her or talking against Waltz because they can actually address it and they can address it energetically. And I think that people are so incredibly tired of just listening to these things and being like, oh, of course it's Trump. He's not going to answer questions realistically. He's just going to say a couple of things that are that are deflectionary and we're just going to move on from it. I think people are really trying to hone in on like, no, this is what I've asked you and you're not providing me with the answer that I've asked you. Please, please try to answer it. One definitely senses a change in the dynamic, and it's not one at the moment that is favorable to Trump. It's important to recognize that lots of political scientists, people who spend their lives studying American elections, are very skeptical of these kinds of conversations about campaign tactics, uh, about mood, about vibe, uh, uh, and so forth. However, those generalizations of experts are based on the past history of elections. And we've never quite had a situation like this. Uh, and the shift from Biden to uh, Harris has been quite extraordinary in terms of the mood, because there's never quite been a, 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 a presidential candidate like Biden, an incumbent at that level of, uh, uh, who had that level of difficulty in communicating and getting his message across, who displayed as evidently as Biden did the signs of age. This was a new thing in American politics. And so the shift to Harris, which in the past people would have thought, well, I mean, fundamentals are going to determine elections. How is the economy doing? How do people think their own personal lives are going? Those uh, big Broad macro factors normally are thought to be the dominant factor in elections, but there has never been a situation like this one, and it's hard to deny that that shift in uh, energy, uh, shift in dynamism, shift in mood, is it's just hard to deny that's a pretty big factor. Yeah, I think it's also, you know, the voting population now, like the people that are actually going to be deciding the election are 18 to 29, right? So those are also, this is also like a very new school audience that is not used to communicating with these like big political speeches and big words where people talk about the economy. They kind of want to know the down low of, you know, who you are and what do you want for this country? At least that's how I feel in layman's terms. And I think that one of the biggest strengths of Kamala Harris is honestly her campaign managers who have been putting out TikToks and Instagram reels and YouTube 
YouTube videos like There Is No Tomorrow with very relevant things. And when she hears Trump uh, sort of dirt talk her, when, he, when she hears him use these tropes and stuff, she turns them into humor, but then directly addresses them. And I think that that's refreshing for the American people for the past eight years, because we're so used to these answers being compiled by politicians like Biden and Trump in a manner that avoids addressing reality to begin with. And she's just sort of like, yeah, he's a convicted felon and I'm a prosecutor and I'm going to be uh, directly addressing every single thing that he stands for that I stand against and that American people should be standing against. And I'm not going to be putting it in um, highly academic language. So you sit here and try to listen to me and not understand anything I'm saying while I'm trying to sort of uh, convince you to vote for me. And I think that's been a very good refreshing strategy. Very much so. I would say that, the, you know, the, I agree with all the commentary. And personally, it's my own personal experience, the transformation in her uh public presence between what she was presenting in the 2020 primary and what she's presenting now is dramatic. Uh, she is coming across way more genuinely. In 2020, she came off far more like a traditional politician, uh, where her um, uh, sound bites seemed to be scripted by screen uh, by uh, writer uh, by uh, uh, campaign writers rather than by herself. Now she's coming off much more. Um, relatable, I think, to many, many people. At least that's the common view. However, there is a big question mark over this. It's important to recognize. Her persona, as perceived, is has been carefully curated by that media team, by that social media team, and by these very, very well-attended rallies. We have not yet seen her in an unscripted news conference, Q&A, or debate. Uh, and it is or, or town hall meeting type format. And so there still is a question mark on how she will do under those circumstances. But nonetheless, I agree with the thrust of your comment, which there has been a huge and consequential transformation in how she presents herself to the public from what we saw back in 2020. I actually, before we move on to like the next part of the subject of this conversation, which is going to be Ukraine and uh, and kind of what Ukraine can expect based on whether Kamala or Trump prevails, I actually want to know myself, because we're talking about how dynamics and politics are changing and you're a professor of uh, poli-sci essentially, but government, we're going to stick to Dartmouth, <laughs> to Dartmouth definition of the subject. And uh, I'm curious as to how in your experience teaching the students of this generation versus past generations changed based on how like the politics is changing? I think it's, uh, I, I do think the, the information space is the biggest change that uh, when I started out in this profession, and even really when I came to Dartmouth, um, the media landscape, the information landscape had not been so utterly transformed by social media. Now it is. Now everybody curates their own feed as to what they get uh, and what they see and what they hear and what analysis they read. And that does generate uh, a, a, a great many differences. As you said, I mean, uh, when you were talking about Kamala Harris's um, uh, persona, her perception, her presentation to the American public, so much has been curated through, especially for the younger demographic, has been curated through their social media feeds, through arresting uh, compelling sound bites uh, through beautifully crafted videos of vignettes of powerful emotive speeches. And that does affect how people perceive and think about politics in ways that we really didn't have 20 years ago. Yeah. I mean, I also personally have a conspiracy theory, if I've ever had one. Um, I wonder if you would agree with this. Do you think that potentially and i mean i don't i don't think i don't fully think the democrats had the capacity to do that but they were losing pretty badly and biden was doing really bad and we can see that one of the things that the Republicans are not doing very well in this information space is they have no attacks or tropes against Kamala Harris that aren't very evidently bad and easily disproved because they were simply not prepared. Like they've spent, you know, billions of dollars of campaign money campaigning against Biden and reinforcing these tropes of him needing to go to an, a, you know, a nursing home, essentially, and him having dementia and all of these things that we've heard before. Right. They don't necessarily have anything to say about her other than, well, she's a woman, she's black 
like she laughs ba bad and like, oh, she was tough as a prosecutor, which she wasn't really. And it's easily disproved as well. Do you think that maybe the Democrats made an ace of spades move and let Biden run again? Because he did say that he was going to be a one term president. Right. And they let him run again and then made him drop out three months before the election because they potentially might have seen that that would be a winning strategy, at least because the re Republicans would be caught off guard. I can't accept that conspiracy theory. I really do believe Biden wanted to wanted to run, thought he was the best candidate. You are all, if I may, don't yeah. take this as being impolite. You are forgetting how negatively Kamala Harris was viewed as a candidate only three or four weeks ago. People thought she hadn't a prayer. And this transformation in her perception has been dramatic. And whether it's consistently, whether it can be consistently maintained is really open to question. But when Biden was stumbling after that debate, the conventional wisdom was, if we have to go to Kamala Harris, it's going to be a disaster. People thought she was a terrible uh, candidate. And so I can't quite, uh, I can't quite uh, uh, fully accept that, uh, that, that, that theory, although, uh, to be sure, it has caught the Republicans off guard and on the back foot. But believe me, it's not going to take them long to find their talking points to find their uh, attacks. And they already have found them in trying to portray Waltz and Kamala as super left wing. And it's not necessarily biting yet, but they're going to find plenty of evidence. They're going to find it from her 2020 campaign. They're going to find it from his time as a relatively progressive governor of a relatively progressive state where the politics were dominated by Dem Democrats. And so the entire uh, legislative agenda that he oversaw in Minnesota was pretty progressive. And uh, and they're going to find all kinds of quotes uh, that are going to uh, help them try to portray these two as out-of-touch lefties. And, uh, and the conventional wisdom in American politics is the only way to win these swing states is to be perceived as centrists. Uh, well, yeah, to be perceived as centrist and also I guess Ukraine and Palestine are a very big factor for a lot of voters. I guess Ukraine is a very big fo factor for uh, older voters and Palestine is a very big factor for younger voters, which we kind of and, and also then there is Russia and Russian disinformation and uh, based on a lot of evidence. And I can't say that it's proven, but based on a lot of evidence, obviously, um, Russian bot farms do have a hand in helping Trump and his campaign spread the messages that they need to spread and sort of attack Democrats in in. in attack Democrats through these leftist tropes and find, I guess, propaganda for them. Because it does seem that any single time you are on Twitter or anywhere and there is a bot talking about, you know, Donald Trump is the best. I do have them in my personal YouTube comments. Honestly, they're kind of funny. But you, you know, you start interacting with them and you realize that it's a Russian that doesn't really speak English very well and they have been fed a couple of narratives and that's what they use. But... Um, what do you think? And I mean, we have a lot of conversations about what's going to happen to Ukraine, right? When uh, if Trump becomes president and obviously in layman's terms, the expression is, well, Ukraine is screwed, right? From a from a perspective of, of someone who is an academic who can explain this a little more uh, wide, broadly and in better terms, what do you think the situation is going to be like with the relationship with Ukraine and obviously the war if Trump were to become president? It's as certain as anything can be in, a pol in, in, in politics and foreign policy that a Trump presidency would be bad for Ukraine. Uh, if for the simple reason that his party is divided on the issue of Ukraine, whereas the, Repo the Democratic Party is less divided and much more united in support of Ukraine. Uh, there's a substantial element uh, within the Republican elite and the foreign policy sort of ecosystem that is highly skeptical of U.S. aid to Ukraine and is indeed highly skeptical of the U.S. role in NATO and the U.S. role in Europe. This section of the of the Republican foreign policy establishment strongly argues for the U.S. to de-emphasize its role in NATO, to let the Europeans take over, and to focus its efforts on what they see as the main challenge, which is China. And this is a very serious and not crazy, uh, it's a, it's a thought-out uh, foreign policy position, and it's strongly represented within the uh, within the uh, foreign policy establishment of the Republican Party. In addition, the foreign policy, the uh, electorate, uh, the Republican electorate is divided on Ukraine. Many of them remain in favor. Uh, and many uh, elected representatives uh, in the Republican Party remain in favor of, uh, of, of Ukraine, remain extremely concerned about Russia's threat to European security. But there's a substantial element within that party uh, that is highly skeptical of Ukraine, that views it the way Trump does, 
and uh, and that is going to make any uh, Republican, uh, any Trump administration way less amenable uh, to open ended or even not open ended support for Ukraine's cause. So, I mean, that's a good that's a good answer. I also find it very funny that Republicans, you know, try to portray China as their main issue. Well, the MAGA Republicans, I guess, because I don't want to, you know, I feel like every single time that I say Republicans, I'm insulting a lot of uh, a lot of voters because uh, MAGA and the party that it has become recently doesn't represent a lot of these voters. But I guess when I say Republicans in political conversations, I mean the far right Republicans that are in the government, not necessarily the voters. Um, it's funny that they uh, pose China as a threat because, for instance, things like Project 2025 and a lot of their other initiatives have been proven to have roots in China. So it's, it's a very interesting double political game they're playing here. And clearly they have a lot of fascist ten tendencies and dictatorial tendencies. And who else? Who else to learn from than Russia and China in this in this sort of situation? But uh, so as you might know, and you probably do, uh, the kind of the opinion of Biden in Ukraine and his presidency and the help that has been provided so far under his administration is very lukewarm in this country. And people of Ukraine are wondering, and I have an opinion on this, but I'm curious to hear your opinion before I sort of give you mine and see what you think. But how do you think Kamala's presidency and her policy towards Ukraine would be different than that of Biden's? It strongly suggests, all the available evidence suggests that it's going to be much more favorably inclined towards Ukraine, much more traditional with respect to the role of NATO, much more a sharing the standard American establishment foreign policy view that America's role in Europe is necessary uh, for um, U.S. and global security, and that Ukraine's um, that denying Russia a victory in Ukraine is an important American national security interest. This has been evident so far, at least in all the statements we've been able to find and all the positions we've been able to discover of uh, vice presidential nominee uh, Tim Waltz. And uh, the same goes for Kamala Harris, who has uh, strongly articulated the administration's position with respect to Ukraine. Bear in mind, Kamala, however, and bear in mind, however, as you know, uh, the Biden administration's policy in Ukraine has been, in the eyes of many, certainly many in Ukraine, careful, uh, circumspect, uh, worried more about escalation than many people uh, in Ukraine and in the United States and elsewhere think they should be worried. And so it has not, uh, it has uh, you know, slowly rolled out uh, uh, availability of various kinds of weapon system. As far uh, to Ukraine, it has been, uh, uh, as you'll know, in the uh, summit in Washington of the NATO uh, alliance, talking about a future uh, for Ukraine in NATO, but at the same time, careful language about how there has to be consensus within the alliance in, uh, before a concrete membership action plan is put together. All of that has been Biden administration policy. So far, I have not been able to discover in the foreign policy circles around Kamala Harris a, 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 um, a evidence to suggest that she would be more um, uh, favorable towards aid to Ukraine than the Biden administration from what she hails. But we don't know that for sure. So um, I have been able to discover some rumors, at least. So we all know that National Security Advisor is Jake Sullivan. Jake Sullivan was also the NATSEC for Obama as well. And uh, he uh, he is uh, slightly relevant to the drone strikes and to some quite questionable, I guess, foreign policy decision decisions when it concerns national security. And a lot of people do think that because he's the national security advisor, the fault lies with him. So the rumored national security advisor for Kamala Harris is Philip Gordon, who in 2018 wrote what I would call a manifesto <laughs> on how we should start a Cold War with Russia and explaining all the national security threats that Russia poses, especially within the you know 2016 election and the role of bot farms and Russian disinformation in uh, aiding Trump to win, in his opinion. So... Do you think that that would potentially change the picture if he were to be the national security secretary? And also, in my personal opinion, one of the reasons why the aid is being rolled out so slowly and so carefully is because, well, all of the politicians around Biden and Biden himself, they kind of grew up in the Cold War era where Russia was the big and mighty USSR. And I feel like maybe on a personal level, they still see it as the big and mighty USSR rather than, you know, Russia with all of its problems and all of its nuclear red lines and crying wolf and all of these things that they promise to do and then never do because they simply do not have the capacity to. 
I agree that Philip Gordon's pro, uh, profile, public profile and positions taken do seem to be more forward leaning on Ukraine uh, than uh, than what we've seen from Jake Sullivan. However, I am much more cautious in forecasting that that would result in a substantial change in U.S. policy. I think the U.S. Um, view on uh, that the, uh, uh, the United States of America is not willing to uh, face a serious risk of war with Russia over the fate of Ukraine is deeply embedded within the American national security establishment. It is not simply limited to the personal uh, personal position of Jake Sullivan. And I do think it would be very hard to uh, and very unlikely to dislodge this. Bear in mind that many of the aides, including Jake Sullivan himself, are considerably younger than Joe Biden, and their main careers were made after the Cold War. Indeed, most of the American national security establishment's fundamental experience of foreign affairs has been post-Cold War with a very, very weak Russia. Indeed, if you could fault them or criticize uh, them, going back to the Obama administration, it was for underestimating Russia's threat, if not underestimating its power, at least underestimating its threat. And that's because they came of age in a foreign policy world where Russia was really on its back and really incapable of uh, uh, of acting decisively in foreign affairs, uh, love it or love him or hate him, I personally uh, hate him. Putin did manage to uh, oversee a reconstitution of the Russian state that allows it to act much more decisively in international relations. If I think disastrously, but more decisively. And it's taken the U.S. foreign policy establishment a while to catch up to that reality. So I a little bit disagree with your premise that American policy towards Russia has been blinkered by a sense that uh, it was still as strong as the Soviet Union. That might well have applied to Biden himself to some degree, but most of the foreign policy establishment is a creature of the uh, so-called unipolar period uh, after the demise of the Soviet Union, when the American power bestrode the world in unprecedented uh, uh, degree of influence. Well, I don't, I don't necessarily think that the whole establishment sees Russia in terms of the Cold War and the Soviet Union. I do think that the old, older politicians probably might, because it, I do tend to, for instance, when I meet people that have visited Ukraine or Russia only during the USSR, it does seem like that's the imprint of how they see Russia and how they see Ukraine. And no matter how much the world changes, that's sort of your first impression, right? That's why they say first impressions matter. And if you and if you sort of spend a lot of time seeing Russia as, as part of the USSR, it is very hard to kind of separate from that. I also do think that the young politicians probably were fooled like the rest of the world by Russia because, you know, in their whole we're a democratic country yearning to be uh, independent and, uh, you know, help our citizens and not be the Soviet Union or the Russian Empire trope, which was very clearly just um, an illusion that they played very well and continued with the KGB tactics of polluting American info spaces and, uh, and you know, continuing with their propaganda and really, um, I would say, invading the United States and other Western countries from the media space rather than, you know, what was feared in the Cold War, which were the nuclear weapons. So I do think that there was a mixture of both fearing Russia as seeing it as the USSR and also not taking Russia seriously with Obama particularly. I tend to think that, you know, that that, that whole situation or I mean, I'm not going to call the original invasion of Ukraine that whole situation, but I kind of did. Um, I think that that happened after the drone strikes that were very controversial and Obama probably did not want to make another move which would be as controversial as that because that wouldn't necessarily be very good for him and his ratings and his polling. So that might have also influenced the situation and his response to Ukraine, which was uh, objectively atrocious. Yeah, I mean, I do think that uh, the, if, if you, with hindsight, looking back at how the United States and its NATO allies and much of the world responded to Russia's intervention in Ukraine in 2014 uh, in Crimea and in and, and Donbass, um, is uh, in hindsight, it seems going to be extraordinarily um, uh, uh, lacking in uh, take in seriousness. Um, at the time, there was this thought that somehow there could be a negotiated settlement. You're all aware of the Minsk process. There was the sense that sanctions would somehow bring Russia to a negotiation, et cetera, et cetera. You're familiar with this entire uh, history. I do think 2016 um, intervention in U.S. domestic politics by uh, Russia was a wake-up call. It did take a while for Washington to to, to realize the seriousness uh, and uh, and boldness of that disinformation intervention meddling operation uh, coming from Russia approved by Putin. There was a couple of months 
I think where your description is completely accurate, where the American establishment was just not really believing what was happening. It was just hard to grasp that Russia would do such a crazy thing. And I, I do think since then the reaction has been much uh, much stronger and much more uh, and much more concerted. There's been an update in the threat assessment in much of the U.S. national security establishment regarding Russia after those events. Uh, you know, it's. It's it was an attack on the United States as opposed to an attack on eastern Ukraine and Crimea. It was felt domestically in a way that yeah. attack on a, on a foreign country isn't. And so I hate to admit it, but it's true that 2016 had a bigger effect on American perceptions of Russia's threat than 2014. Oh, of course. I mean, also, uh, as someone, and I say this very respectfully, as someone who's lived in the U.S. for 13 years, and I consider myself largely Americanized, and probably, you know, uh, a lot of people in Ukraine see me as, like, someone who is very quirky American, who somehow is Ukrainian as well. So I say this with, like, with love, <laughs> but I do think that Americans tend to see the world through the lens of America, and if it's not felt and seen through the lens of the United States, it, Americans just don't understand it. And that's largely because... Also, I mean, a, a lot of the country is is kind of always within the country and uh, Americans don't tend to travel a lot abroad. And well, not not don't tend to that. I'm not going to generalize. A lot of Americans do travel abroad, but the large majority don't. But also America is so big that, you know, traveling state to state is kind of like traveling abroad in some senses. But I do I think, think it's true. Yeah, uh, the, the, the day, the polling, the expertise, the experts on government and political science will tell you foreign policy always ranks quite low in American voting behavior. And you earlier said in this conversation that, you know, older people tend to be sympathetic towards the, the cause of Ukraine against Russia. Younger people tend to be have some sympathies with the Palestinian, the plight of the Palestinians uh, in Gaza. Um, uh, but even there polling shows that these issues rank very low among their priorities. To be perfectly frank, your American voter typically could not care less where the eastern border of Ukraine is. They don't know where it is, and they couldn't care less uh, where it is. They are not going to be moved by the claim that some that Ukraine has lost territory to Russia. The elite cares. They care because they worry about the norm against territorial aggression. They worry that if Russia learns the lesson or spreads the lesson in the world that conquering territory works, mm -hmm. that's going to be bad for America. So the elite does care about the outcome of the war in Ukraine. The population has no idea where this border is and doesn't care. They don't oh. care where which country Crimea is part of. That's just a reality that the politicians in America have to be uh, have to be aware of. I can tell you that I have friends. I have I have, I shouldn't say friends. I have people I know. Mm -hmm. who are veterans who volunteered for Ukraine, went and trained soldiers or fought in Ukraine, where they have had comrades die in Ukraine. And the families of those comrades have no idea where they were. They can't pronounce the names of these towns. They don't know what's going on. So it is a, it is a, it's just a reality of politics in the United States. The foreign policy in general and the specific outcome of this fateful war are not going to be highly salient issues for American voters. I mean, trust me, I know. I know a lot of uh, foreign volunteers in Ukraine who fight on the front lines who have seen their friends die and convince me that Trump is going to be the saving grace for Ukraine and they're still voting for him, not understanding how they're directly voting against what they're currently doing within the country. I also do find the people that educate me the most and how I don't know anything about the country I was born and raised in are the people who also cannot point to it on a map. And also my personal favorite is back in 2014, I was on a date in America and a guy asked me if I speak Ukrainese. So, <laughs> you know, I am fully aware of all the things that are happening within America in regards to geography and geopolitics, because I mean, to be fair, we're not doing a very good job in America in teaching it. And I guess uh, just for like the sake of, uh, I guess, entertainment for you in a history class, a professor of mine who was German showed a map with clicker prompts and was like, please show me where France is on this map. France is big, right? So people chose Russia. 75% of the class chose Russia as France because it's big. <laughs> so <laughs> my introduction... That would, not happen at, that would not happen at Dartmouth. <laughs> 
<laughs> Have you ever been in a geography class at Dartmouth? Because <laughs> you speak about the politics, right? But so this brings me to, we touched a little bit upon NATO. I know that you, your view is that we should help Ukraine as much as possible, but you don't see Ukraine's membership in NATO anytime soon. Can you walk me through that a little bit? I think the NATO uh, question is a distraction from the real issue, which is making sure Ukraine uh, uh, does as absolutely as well as it can in this war, which requires concrete, expensive uh, um, military and non-military assistance uh, to Ukraine. And that is a tough call. We have, I frankly, not done as well as, as we should have. That terrible delay in the last supplemental bill had deleterious effects on Ukraine. So we should be focusing on that. I think the uh, NATO discussion is a distraction for the simple reason that Article 5 guarantees for NATO are not going to apply while Ukraine is at war. And therefore, the whole question of what Ukraine would enter uh, NATO and what the obligations would be are all contingent upon the outcome of the war. And the outcome of the war is going, to be turned, is going to be determined first and foremost by what Ukrainians do, but secondly, by how much help they get. So I've just, I've always failed to understand this obsession with talk about um, Ukraine now. It's easy to talk about it. What's hard is to allocate the resources Ukraine needs to prevail in this war. But why do you think this discussion about NATO is so prevalent among Ukrainians and is such a big thing for us and why we we want this guarantee, we, sort, we want this invitation, we want a commitment that Ukraine is going to be in NATO. Why do you think that is? I think it's symbolic of the commitment to Ukraine's cause. So that's totally understandable. That is to say, the future, to say now that the future of Ukraine is in NATO, that there's absolutely no question that Ukraine will be a member of NATO, to say those things now is reassuring as a sense of commitment uh, to Ukraine belonging in the West and to Ukraine ultimately getting um, some guarantee of its security against a resurgent Russia. So those are all understandable. But the fact that the thing is, there is no consensus at all in the United States or in many other NATO countries uh, to be willing to go to war with Russia over Ukraine. It's just not there. And that's what membership of NATO means. You have to build that support. You well, have to build it. And that's going to take time. So declaring, simply declaring, making declarations is not going to change the political reality. And in fact, it weakens NATO to say that you're going to do things that you're not prepared to do. Uh, and so for all those reasons, I did sign that infamous letter saying that now is not the time. I never meant in signing that letter to say that we should rule out Ukraine being a member of NATO in the future. I, I simply did. said that right now it is a distraction from the real issue. I don't think you did. I think that uh, I think that you mean very well and you clearly support Ukraine and, and clearly have Ukraine's best interest at heart as much as America's. I just think that and I'm going to try to explain this without sounding patronizing by any means because I don't mean to. But I think one of the things that Western uh, Western even uh, experts fail to realize from seeing it from the Ukrainian perspective is that it's not even about NATO going to war for us. Like we fully understand that until, you know, the borders are solidified and until we have taken back our territories and until uh, there is some sort of a peace agreement signed with Russia, NATO is not going to trigger Article 5 for Ukraine. I think the issue here is that Russia knows that NATO is not going to uh, give Ukraine a guarantee or an invitation while this is happening. So Russia is going to try and prolong the war happening with all it has in order to prevent that membership from happening ever. Because, of course, Russia is going to attack Ukraine while Ukraine has all the security guarantees from partners because we've had, you know, we've had the Budapest Memorandum before. We've had so many security guarantees. We've had so many promises. We've had, you know, promises of equipment that shows up eight months late. We've had promises of quantities of equipment that then shows up in one-thirds or one-fourth of, of that equipment. Russia fully understands that guarantees, promises, contracts are a very different different thing than saying, yes, Ukraine is 100 percent going to be in NATO. We are inviting you into it, but on a condition that we can't provide, for instance, like Article 5 at the moment, uh, while while like there is a still border dispute with Russia. I think that the issue here is that we are not asking for NATO to trigger Article 5. We are asking for a concrete 
uh, commitment to see us in NATO, because from our perspective, from having dealt with Russia for so long, and I think from Russian perspective, until there is this concrete invitation into NATO, they're not going to care no matter what we do, because there have been new technology, there have been F-16s, there have been attackums, there have been Taurus missiles, there have been all of these things. And, you know, Russia still blows up our hospitals and it doesn't matter how much support the U.S. pledges or NATO as a whole pledges, they still, you know, they still escalate every single day. Again, the commitment has no meaning if it does not reflect a genuine understanding of the national interests of the members of NATO. That understanding does not now exist. Therefore, to make the commitment will not have any effect on Russia's calculations. It would only have an effect on Russia's calculation if it is backed up by concrete action. The litmus test is concrete actions, not declarations. Of all, I mean, everything you said actually just buttresses the case that making declarations that are not backed up by concrete uh, and national interest commitments do not have, uh, are not worth the paper they're written on. I will mention, how, just in passing, I know you know this, that the Budapest memorandum was no security guarantee. It was a security assurance. It was basically saying, we won't violate your borders. So the only country that violated its commitment to Budapest is Russia. Um, but NATO is a much bigger deal. But if it is not backed by a true commitment, it's only going to degrade the currency of NATO membership. Well, interestingly, speaking of the Budapest Memorandum, the Ukrainian side, uh, and this is like a very, uh, this is a subject that has come up a lot since the beginning of the full-scale invasion, but the Ukrainian side that was the signatory to the Budapest Memorandum was saying that actually it was presented to them as a security guarantee, which is why they gave they gave up the nuclear weapons. But there, but you can always trick things within translations because some documents are signed in Russian on one side oh. and some documents are sa- signed in English on the other side. So we have felt a little bit tricked through the Budapest memorandum in that sense, because, of course, no one wants to provide security guarantees to, you know, to a country like Ukraine at that point in time over over a potential territorial dispute with Russia that had just belonged to the same union as Ukraine five minutes ago. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, the the text, as far as I read it, says that they agree solemnly to respect the territorial integrity of Ukraine. And so the country that signed that agreement and that has has brutally violated it, is the Russian Federation. Is the Russian Federation that signed it along with France and the UK and, and right. the US. And there there was like... And a, the UK and like, France have respected Ukraine's sovereignty. Yeah, did not come to help us but <laughs> at first, but that's... Uh, and that's I mean, not that's what a, the agreement says. The agreement doesn't say we're going to defend you. It says we're going to respect your, and, your sovereignty. Well, that's again uh, what I was trying to what I was trying to say here is that within the Russian translation there is ambigu- ambiguity there where you could argue uh, okay. that that was a that within within the way that they translated it into Russian, which obviously no one no one cares about the Russian version of this document. It's the it's the English version that matters. But within what they were signing, it did seem a lot more like a security guarantee than just an assurance that like, hey, we're you know we're going to stay away from you. Uh, and obviously, in that case, the only country that violated it is Russia. And in that case, you know, we don't owe you anything. But that's that's an issue of 30 years ago, of, well, 40 at this point. So it's not something that's worth discussing as much as I guess I have in, in the past 10 minutes. Right. But I do want to come back a little bit to um, to the NATO situation. I do see where you're coming from when you were saying that uh, I said it myself, that it doesn't matter. You know, it's not worth the paper that it's written on. But I think that. In this particular scenario, it's because of how much has been discussed and because of how much there is the belief on both the Russian side and the Ukrainian side that this is that this is this milestone that Ukraine that is being made unreachable to Ukraine. I think there is a symbolic meaning, but a symbolic in a way where uh, I'll draw you a parallel. So if Ukraine were to take Crimea tomorrow. Ukraine would still not have the capacity to take back Donbass, right? But because Crimea is the Achilles' feet for uh, foot for Russia, or Achilles' heel got him, forgetting how to speak English since I've lived in Ukraine for the past seven months now, <laughs> but since it's the Achilles', Achilles heel for Russia, it, do, it, it there is a very high likelihood that the Russian front line in Donetsk uh, would and in Luhansk would collapse simply because of the demoralization of the Russian soldiers as a first factor, because Crimea is something that they see as this like impenetrable fortress that belongs to Russia. So in this particular case, I think that uh, that maybe the talk about how it's not it's not the right time or it's not something to be offered to be offered to Ukraine at the moment is simply 
working against Ukraine and demoralizing the population and giving Russia a lot more, um, especially when it comes from Western uh, intellectuals like yourself, it gives Russia a lot more fuel to see, ha, huh, NATO doesn't want you. We told you that. Wouldn't you, would you agree with that? I can see that. I understand your argument. I think it's a serious one. I just have to say I disagree that you can make politics and strategy based on such sentiments. I really do think concrete things on the ground matter. I am extremely skeptical of arguments about sudden, quick demoralization of hundreds of thousands of Russian forces. It would be great if it were to happen. Maybe. I think it is probably a, uh, it is probably, a, I, I see it as an, uh, as an untenable or unreliable way of making uh, your policy. Similarly, there was a time 15 years ago when you could simply declare, hey, you're a member of NATO. And simply saying that was, we didn't actually have to be able to defend the countries. Oh my God, America has said that Estonia is a member of NATO, therefore we'll never touch it. This is a different world, okay? We have a massive land invasion of Ukraine happening. This is a very different world than it was in 1997, 1999, 2003, and the other expansions uh, of, of the other periods of NATO enlargement. And therefore, it has to be thought about differently. What's going to matter is going to be concrete capabilities on the ground and concrete real commitments by countries in a world where a great power war is a possibility in a way that it wasn't during the first um, expansion uh, ex uh, enlargements of NATO. Well, we're sort of on a doorstep of World War Three, right? Well, we're 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 we are like in the doorstep of World War Three, based on like the geopolitical dynamics in the world and and all of that, all of that, and I think people are not seeing it because World War Three to them seems like trenches and everywhere all over Europe, but it's not necessarily how 2024 works because it is a different world. And to that argument, you know, since we do live in a different world, and since NATO was technically created, you know. Uh, if we if we talk about the unspeakable, it is to protect the world against Russia. It is to protect the world against America's biggest adversaries, right? Or the West's biggest adversaries. And I find it very interesting that, you know, the rules of joining NATO and the idea of Article 5 and how they view protection stayed within the realm of when it was created. But in reality, right now, we're living in this world where there is a real situation on hand for NATO countries. And NATO countries are already supplying us with weapons weapons and already giving us assurances and guarantees and deliveries of weapons. So wouldn't it make a lot more sense to restructure how uh, how a country is accepted into NATO and, for instance, uh, and for, in and for instance, r give Ukraine a member, a conditional membership in which all of the signatories are obliging themselves or obliging the alliance to providing Ukraine a specific amount of help without triggering Article 5, because that would be basically what NATO is already doing, but with that symbolic, um, symbolic trope of Ukraine being in NATO. Again, I just don't see how the symbolic aspect helps. What would help would be the commitment. Jens Stoltenberg, the outgoing NATO Secretary General at Washington, argued what we need to do is have a concrete, ironclad commitment uh, to large-scale transfers of Ukraine uh, of aid to Ukraine that would be that would be as uh, for as long as the war goes on. So, so let's say a ten-year commitment, just to say it. Of course, it would stop once the war stops. Yeah. Uh, and they were on. Uh, they could not secure that agreement in, in Washington. To me, that was the main failure. The failure to make a symbolic declaration about NATO enlargement to me is not is not is not the important matter. The important matter is there was no consensus, no political will to be able to make that long term commitment, which is what I would argue is necessary. Well, it is necessary, but I guess. Uh, I uh, I think I'm going to leave you with this, right? So we are in the situation we are in in terms of Russia encroaching itself on the, uh, on all of the West because all of the Western bright minds, and I mean politically speaking, the people in power, failed to understand Russia for so long while Ukraine has been telling the world this entire time exactly what's happening, why it's happening, and the fact that, you know, you know, you know guys, it's not going to stop at us. It's not a localized conflict. It's a lot it's a lot bigger issue than that. So I guess the idea here is that 
A frustrating factor within the Ukrainian society and within Ukrainian bright minds is that we are not being heard because there is so much research and there are so many of these things that the West considers more important than what we say might be the important step based on understanding how Russia functions, how they think and what sort of what fuels them and what it like and what pegs like pegs them down a notch right so would you agree that maybe it's time to listen to ukrainians a little more than we listen to western ex experts no i think when you're talking about western foreign policy when you're talking about american foreign policy i think american experts are are are, are you know should have a voice when you talk about you what ukraine should do uh, ukrainians should have a voice but i agree with you so what I what I'm channeling for you is trying to think about the American national interest, which is not always exactly the same as Ukrainian national interest. What I would say though is you're absolutely right that experts, including people like me, failed to listen carefully, to study carefully, to unpack carefully what was going on between Russia and Ukraine. And particularly, I totally accept this argument: too Russia focused, not enough focused on Ukrainian perspective. You can accept that. That as an analyst, you need to be better at understanding the perspectives of countries bordering on Russia. But at the same time, that's not the same as saying that um, that the, there there's never any difference between American threat perceptions and Ukrainian threat perceptions. Well, I mean, I don't necessarily. So uh, I I want to make it very clear that I do care about American both foreign and domestic policy a lot because uh, I you know I still kind of half live in, in the United States and I'm a. a I'm a resident of the United States and I'm also a Ukrainian citizen, so I care about both countries, I would say, equally, um, except for this is where I was born and raised. So, <laughs> you know, at the time, the time calls for me to be here and do everything that I can do. But I do think that when I say listen to Ukrainians is like what I am worried about is that we are going to miss the mark again and we're going to let Russia um, let Russia invade the West even further by, you know, not listening to Ukrainians in, in a way that like we've dealt with this threat so much. And I know that our situation with Russia is very different than American situation with Russia. Russia's not going to roll tanks into New York, you know, but at the same time, the way that their disinformation works, the way that they the, the way that they uh, incorporate their their spies the way that they do all of these things that we continuously keep pointing out and the West is just not listening to it because they don't consider it, you know, they don't, don't consider it, they consider it far-fetched. I think this is where I am just worried that because Ukrainian voices are still dim dismissed so much and our sort of understanding of Russia is still dismissed so much, I feel like the world might sort of miss the mark again and make it worse. That's... Well, I hope... I hope you're wrong. <laughs> I hope I'm I do, wrong too. <laughs> but you know, I, for, unfortunately, I do have to come off this call yeah. uh, because it, it, someone else is going to come into this space in just about a minute. No, that's um, also. I think we're. <laughs> I think we're very, very much done, and I've asked you everything I wanted to ask you. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time. Thank you. It was a great conversation. <laughs> Thank you. It was very nice to speak to you as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Well, that was very interesting. And I do sure hope that one day we can discuss this political situation a little, a little further, especially as it develops. And But for now, that's all we have for you for today. And please do look out for the next video next week with another burning question that sets the Internet on fire. And don't forget to follow the gays to see those videos and to listen to other fantastic journalists on this channel who provide you with amazingly detailed and broad information about Ukraine and the West and how they coincide. And don't forget to like this video and share it to friends. In the meanwhile, I'll see you later.